enabled for live stream. Yeah, it looks like it's working here. Give it one more second and it should be. Yeah, Beautiful. it looks good. Go ahead. Anytime, Mayor. Oh, okay, we're good. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the March 3rd meeting of the Common Council. Uh, we'll call it to order. Any additions to or deletions from the agenda? I am not seeing any. Uh, no proclamations. Uh, are any municipal officials here Looking for anybody from the county or the town? Uh, Mayor, we do have Rich John in the waiting room, but I believe that he, he signed up to speak as a speaker. Um, but I can bring him in if you want. Would rather yeah, have let's, him speak. Now. Let's uh, let's do that. And if and if he's here to speak, then that's the next item on the agenda, and he can just kick off our public comment portion. Okay. So one just brief note: I know a lot of folks are here for public comment to speak about the reimagining public safety draft, and uh, we welcome all that feedback and appreciate you being here. They just want to note that the the draft is not being voted on or even discussed tonight. It's not on our agenda. There are three uh, coming. Uh, in which council will be discussing that draft. There was one meeting last week, last Wednesday. There's another next Wednesday, March 10th. Uh, another uh, two weeks from then, March 24th. And then a final meeting on March 31st. So that's March 10th, March 24th, and March 31st, where council will be discussing the draft. But this is an open public comment, and this is a good, uh, this is the right place to come to, to voice your feedback on the draft report. Just wanted to make that note in case anybody was then expecting a lengthy discussion at council tonight about it. It's not on not on this agenda. Okay, I see Rich. Hey, uh, welcome. So, were you here for a municipal report or to speak as part of public comment? Uh, I'll do either. I really, uh, you know, I, I put down the public comment because I thought that was the pathway to get into the meeting. But I'm happy to be here as a municipal official. Um, yeah, that was my comment. Then let's, yeah, just, then let's do the, the typical notice up front. Julie and Dan will be running the timer. We'll allow people uh, in to speak as part of public comment. Uh, everybody will get a three minutes. Um, and, uh, and then we'll move on to the next person. We'll ask them to uh, follow the typical rules of, of addressing the Common Council, which is uh, uh, to mean decorum and respect and uh, stick to the three minute limit. Rich doesn't have to do that if he's speaking as a an official, does he? Yes, that's right. So if you if it includes the county report, there's no need to stick to the three minute limit. Um, but the, it's it's not frowned upon either. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to stay under three minutes. Okay. Um, I mainly just wanted to 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 stop in to say thank you to all the city staff and uh, common council members that have participated in the reimagining public safety effort. This has been a long process and it's been a very intense, quick process because of the governor's um, timeline. And I, I think we're, we really have an opportunity to do something meaningful. And as I said at our legislature, county legislature meeting last night, I'm hopeful that we can do it as a joint plan. I think there's real power in that. It reflects the way we worked on it. And frankly, I think we send a much better message and our long-term success um, is far more likely if we can get there as a joint plan. And that, that's the message I gave to my colleagues on the county legislature and I share it with you as well. I, I hope we can get there. If we need to do different reports and separate reports with our own recommendations, you know, we can do that but given that we're talking about the two largest police agencies in the county that really will pull, I think, the other police agencies with them if we can get a joint plan, there's value here. Um, and so I hope we keep that in mind. And I'll stop there. I'm happy to try to answer any questions if anybody has any, otherwise I can go away. Thank you. Any questions for Rich? Well, we appreciate it. I appreciate your service. Rich was the, one of the county liaisons in the draft report and put in many, many hours. So we appreciate it. Okay. See you guys. Thanks. See you. Thank you, Rich.
Okay. Uh, Mayor, are we ready to move on to public speaking then? Yep. Yep. Okay. Thanks. So I have just let in our, our first speaker, who is uh, Michael Brindisi. And at, following Michael will be Dean Servos. So Michael, if you are able to unmute. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Great. Hi. Good, uh, good evening, Council and Mr. Mayor. First of all, I have a tremendous amount of respect for all of you, and I don't envy your position. So please um, <clears throat> do not uh, mistake my passion for uh, disrespect. That is not it at all. I'm the son of a police officer, a nephew of a retired New York City detective, cousin of a congressman, and I'm a proud Democrat, and I hate that I have to even announce that I'm a Democrat. Uh, but I think there's a lot of Democrats that are afraid to stand up and, and back the police here because we feel like the Black Lives Matter movement and maybe some of the uh, city will feel like we're turning our backs on them. And that couldn't be further from the truth. I am very pro Black Lives Matter, uh, but I am also very pro police. And I understand you guys are in a tough position with a mandate to reform the police department. But I think this is really dangerous and you have missed the mark completely. Um, I think that if you read the public uh, or, or the report, um, both focus groups end with the same thing. And the overall theme is they both feel disrespected, disenfranchised, or disconnected to the other. And now we're going to drive a wedge even farther. Um, I think the training and all of that, there definitely needs to be a reform, but this is not the way to go about it. We need to bring everybody together. Um, the officers that were asked these questions didn't know that abolishing the police department was in mind. And also it, it has a tone that like anybody could do. We're just going to hire secure. What is it going to be like fairground security? We're going to hire people from the city. Do they know how to do traffic stops? Do they know how to direct traffic? Um, what's, I, I mean, I, I really suggest that everybody on the council do a ride along with each police officer. Uh, and um, I, I really think every shift, every officer and give these officers the resources they need and they'll be able to do their job better. Um, yes, there is an issue in this country and, and black lives do matter and we need that movement to keep going, but they need to work together, not apart. And I am, I am scared for my children um, I'm scared for myself and the police station will abolish itself because nobody will want to work here, nor will they want to live here if we are having glorified security guards as, as, as police. And uh, Mr. Mayor, the other night you spoke of how you were, you, you didn't like that people were protesting on your lawn. Who would you have been able to call if God forbid you were in danger? And I would never wish that on you. And I respect everything that you are doing. Um, but I just, I really feel as if, They've, I, I, people are saying you just want to get out of the contract situation. I'm going to give you more credit than that. And I don't believe that. But how are these officers supposed to go out and do their job and put that uniform on when they feel like their backs already, uh, the, the, that you have already turned their back on them because of the contract situation? It's like trying to play for a football team. You know, do, do, how do you go out there and play your best when you feel like your team doesn't or your coach doesn't care about you? Uh, I'll just close with this. I know my time is up. Um, I think we need a public referendum on this. I mean, I, I dare you to go to East Hill at 2 a.m. unarmed and see how you feel alone. Um, this is this is dangerous. I, I applaud what you guys are doing. I think there's an answer, but I think we need to come together and, and we've got to stop this divide between the civilians and the police. Um, and, and we need we need to to allow the police to have what they need to succeed. And I and um, I, I appreciate your time and, and thank you so much. Um, we don't want any blood on anybody's hands. We need to empathize and sympathize, sympathize with civilians, but we can't act like civilians. You guys are leaders. I want you to lead and I wish you the best and thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael. Um, next up is Dean Zervos. After Dean is Loretta E. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my, my name is Dean Zervos. I own Simeons on the Commons. I have lived in this great community since uh, 2007, and I really enjoy living here and owning a business right on the commons. Thank you very much to council for all that you're doing right now. Really appreciate it. 
but I think we really have to applaud the police department because they really have done a fantastic job in this city, keeping it together. There has been some times when we have problems, everybody has problems, but to do away with the police departments and this great community with these two large com colleges in our town and all the visitors that we have coming to this community every summer, without a police force, the criminal element will always find a way to do what they have to do. If the police aren't there, they will make their presence known very, very largely, and it will hurt this community in ways that you could not imagine. I've seen it happen before, but it's very important that we stay with the police and support the police. We need to have their presence. We didn't have their presence a little bit this summer because they were, um, their hands were tied this summer. And this is what happened on the commons. A guy was smoking crack in the center of Aurora Street and I was appalled, didn't know what to do. I tried calling the police. They really didn't come and he walked away and then he kept coming back but we stopped him from doing that again because we, we knew what he was gonna do and we told him just to keep walking. But the business owners did that. We should not have to do that. It's one of those things that the police is so important to see their presence, to see them in uniform is very important also so people know who they are. They're a deterrent to the criminal activity that will come into this community in a much larger force if we do not have them. Once again, I thank you all for all of your efforts and everything else like that, but please, it's very important to the business community to have the police to show themselves in the town, in the commons, especially when there are a lot of guests coming to town. Thank you very much and have a great night. Thank you, Dean. Uh, next up is Loretta, and I still have not learned to pronounce your last name. Um, and following Loretta will be Matthew Schweiger. Loretta's fine, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Common Council, and community members. For those of you who don't know me, I am Loretta. I am a resident of the city of Ithaca I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm an Ithaca Housing Authority board member, I'm an Ithaca police sergeant, and I am a veteran of the United States. I, choose, I chose many years ago to live in the community in which I police. I care about the city and all of the people who live, visit, and work in the city of Ithaca. I remember walking the commons as an officer years ago when Savante Myrick was, council, was a council member and running for mayor. It was a warm, sunny day. I was near the west end, it, the west end of the commons when I noticed Mr. Myrick. I approached him and introduced myself. I introduced myself as a resident of the city of Ithaca and a voter. I asked Mr. Myrick what, is his plat, what his platform was and what were his plans and how he had planned to make a difference in our community. On that day, he told me that he wanted to reorganize the city. Speaking about reorganization within the city and consolidation of police forces with the county. He spoke about starting with other departments in the city before moving to the police. I didn't know what, what that idea meant at the time. And it just seemed kind of like doing more with less, maybe to save money, I'm not sure. Um, it was early and he hadn't become mayor yet. So no one really knew. I have served this community since 2004. I have missed birthdays, holidays, and sporting events with my children, my, my family to serve this community. Now, some of you may say that is what I signed up for and you are correct in the fact that I signed up. These simple examples are just some sacrifices, none of which are easy to make. My children have been ridiculed by some people in this community just simply for the career I have chosen. This is, too, this is also very difficult. None of these difficulties compare to how I feel today. I feel that I am seen as not human by both the city administration and the city as an employee of this city. It's like I don't matter. I give everything every day, day in and day out to the people of this community, but yet I feel that I am just a number, not even someone, but something that is not needed. When I read, when I read the proposal for the first time and after I had read point number one, I felt like I had been kicked in the stomach and debilitated by what I had read. 
I physically felt sick. While serving this community, I've had the opportunity to talk and to get to, to know community members from all parts. I'm gonna have to skip a lot. I've been asked by parents to assist them with issues with their children, drug addicted, drug addicted issues, scholarships for students, parents worried about teen suicide. I've gone to other kids' talent shows and plays and request, that they've requested me to go to on my own time. I've, been, I've become a part of this community. The Ithaca Police Department is the most progressive police department that I know. We are open to change and open to discussion on all points outside of point number one. It is believed by many that proposal number one is a way to circumvent labor, the labor agreement and it is a form of union busing. We feel that points two through 19 are being overshadowed by point number one. We as a department already meet several points outlined in the proposal and executive order 203. Please don't forget, police officers are, are people. And I will submit the rest of this that I was unable to speak about because of the lack of time so that you can read it fully and understand what I give to the community. And I'm sure other officers do as well. I'm proud to be an Ithaca police officer, but today I feel very ill. Thank you, Loretta. And uh, thank you for the reminder for the rest of the speakers. Uh, we know that three minutes is a short time period. And if you have written remarks that you'd like to share with Common Council, please feel free to email them at council at, at cityofithaca.org. Um, next is Matthew Schweiger. And after um, Matthew is Scott Guerin. Hello, everyone. Everyone can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Matthew Schweiger. I'm a patrol officer with IPD. I'd like to thank you for hearing me speak today. I'm one of the members of the Ithaca PBA board and I'm here to speak on the labor aspect of the reimagining public safety proposal. This proposal, specifically item one, calls for the dismantling of the Ithaca Police Department and replacing it with an entirely new department. This means that all the hardworking men and women of IPD, the same people who applied a tourniquet to a wounded man who'd been shot less than a day ago, will be forced to reapply to jobs they already have. They would be forced to apply for a new job under a new title that has yet to be defined by civil service. The mayor stated in public forum that we will need to apply for new positions in the department, but has not directly answered the question on if we are all to be fired first to facilitate this or if there will even be enough spots to accommodate all the officers. His unwillingness to give a straight answer on this tells us all we need to know. The mayor has failed to negotiate a fair labor contract with the PBA for nearly a decade now. This, among with many other factors, have led to IPD having lower and lower recruiting members every year. Making the members of IPD reapply to a new department for a new job in a new title that isn't titled as a police officer tells us the mayor is trying to get out from under the current labor agreement and undercut the union, effectively dissolving it. This is union busting plain and simple. It appears all too convenient that the sheriff's office is not slated to be completely dismantled and renamed, while the city PD that's still trying to negotiate a contract is being dismantled. Unions were created in this country to protect the rights of workers and to ensure safe and fair working conditions, and have been an important mechanism for pivotal and progressive societal change. Movers and shakers of this nation's history, including civil rights leaders, have been un union, union leaders, understanding the importance of protecting workers' rights. This proposal as it stands sets a dangerous precedent if it is passed. It would allow the city administration and the mayor to effectively dissolve any labor union they want under the guise of reimagining to get out of any labor agreements they deem unfavorable. This president could then be used by other municipalities throughout the state, damaging workers' rights and unions in New York forever. There's a very good reason many labor unions have reached out to support us. All this raises many questions, but I just have two at this time. Changing the title of IPD members from police officers to this new undefined term would effectively remove us from the police retirement system unless we transfer to another police department. How can you possibly bank on any of the current officers of IPD to fall in line and stay here while their livelihoods and retirements are stripped away? Two, why does the mayor and administration seek to specifically dismantle IPD, ending our union and driving away good officers when our department is already meeting the eight can't wait guidelines set, set forth by Governor Cuomo? Several police reforms such as Duben County have already been praised by the governor as model examples of reform under Executive Order 203, and they don't involve dismantling and rebuilding of entire departments. I've gone on for far enough, but I would like to close with this. I humbly and respectfully request that Common Council reject this proposal for the sake of the community, for the sake of the men and women at IPD, and for the sake of workers' rights throughout the state of New York. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, next up is Scott Guerin, and following Scott will be Ted Schwartz. 
Good evening. I don't feel like I have the time to introduce myself if I, as I'd like to. I'll just offer that I've lived in Ithaca for 23 years, and uh, my priority in life now is the three children I'm raising uh, that attend the city school district right here in the city. Then my 21st year with the Ithaca Police Department serves as lieutenant now. I want to make it clear I don't speak for the Ithaca PBA. I speak for myself and my own experiences. And I'll start by saying I believe that police reforms are necessary and should go hand in hand with legislative and judicial reform so the outcomes of our criminal justice systems reflect the principles that we want to embrace in our culture. Poor policing or criminal conduct by officers needs to be less likely, less frequent, and more intolerable, especially with people of color. And I can tell you that I've heard very prevalently throughout our department, officers make suggestions that are in line with many parts of this reimagining proposal embrace the ideas of recalibrating how and what we are called to respond to, welcome the idea of social and mental health services to address problems on a 24 seven basis and welcome training that would make us best suited to serve the Ithaca community to name a few. I've also heard some fundamental misunderstandings of what it is that we do and how we at IPD approach issues that we are called to address in many of the explanations provided for this reimagining proposal. To me, this indicates that there needs to be and should have been much more dialogue with the agencies involved and from my perspective, this was not a very collaborative process. The way that this proposal seems to be framed by some is that you're either sensitive to race relations, specifically as it relates to police and the history of police with people of color, or you're sympathetic to the police union or labor unions at all, which seems to be a crafty way to polarize this very important dialogue. These are not mutually exclusive principles and seem to mask the desire to undermine the public servants of the city of Ithaca and usurp the labor contract it is with the employees. I'm very concerned about many of the logistics of the ideas proposed in the first recommendation. For one example, having armed response mostly or exclusively to matters of conflict or violence or clearly criminal conduct seems to potentially exacerbate the problems that this reimagining is attempting to address. Uh, I heard the mayor offer an analogy of the context of the police department being like a hammer and what we, and therefore what we see when we respond to calls of service all look like nails. I do not believe that to be true as it relates to how we respond to call to service in the sense that we go into issues looking to make arrests, um, all the issues that we're called to. I actually think that this proposal may encourage a more narrow mindset in our approach to calls to service of armed personnel if it were to go through as it's proposed. In general, it seems that the personnel from the Ithaca Police Department are on board with continuing to make changes consistent with what Ithaca is looking for from its police department. And there's no reason that we can't continue to improve the service we provide without dismantling the department. The professionalism, the ability to adapt, the competency with which officers or a department is able to do their job or accomplish the objectives of serving the public are in direct proportion to the quality of personnel that we are able to recruit, hire and retain, and then train, supervise and lead. It's therefore a function of the leadership selections that have been made. And it is also a very difficult endeavor it has been to find quality employees with the contract being expired for 10 years and other complications. Undermining the relationship that has had been established with your employees will potentially forever erode the trust in the city of Ithaca as an employer and significantly affect our ability to track or retain people that are the right ones to carry out this very important mission and that many of our members are, are looking to embrace. Thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. Uh, next is Ted Schwartz, and following Ted is Justin Baldessari. Good evening, uh, members of council, Mr. Mayor, and the public. Uh, just want to introduce myself for those of you that don't know me. Uh, I'm Ted Schwartz. I grew up here. I went to Ithaca City School District, South Hill, Boynton, IHS, uh, TC3, before I finished out my bachelor's degree. Um, I have been a part of the Ithaca community my entire life. Uh, since I was a teenager, I've worked here. I've attended sports in the city. My kids attend sports in the city. They go to daycare um, in the Ithaca community. I, <clears throat> I work downtown, obviously at the police department. I shop downtown, my gym is downtown. Everything I do um, in my life centers around the city of Ithaca. So I have obviously an interest with my career, but also my family. Uh, many of my family members work and live downtown. Um, I would just like to offer that one of my former roles at the Ithaca Police Department was the training sergeant, where I oversaw the direction and general um, trainings that IPD took on and trained its officers in. And I'd just like to point out that 
many of the trainings that we have done at IPD have been driven from within the union uh, below the rank of chief. And we view ourselves as very progressive. We, we are really driven to meet the needs and the demands of the community. Um, just a real quick recap of some of the things that have been requested by officers and we have sent officers to, to try and help further that mission. Suicide prevention, intervention, post prevention, emergency driving, implicit bias, mental health, naloxone, legal updates, emergency medical care, to include some of our officers being <clears throat> becoming EMTs, child abuse and exploitation, crisis negotiation intervention, uh, sexual assault investigations, critical decision-making during crisis, disability awareness, emotionally disturbed person response, peer support, de-escalation, responding to high-risk victims, implicit and unconscious bias, victim-centered and trauma-informed training, professional development, procedural justice, proper and effective internal investigations, harm reduction, women in command, Alzheimer's and dementia first response, domestic violence investigations, and many others. And that's just over the last four years. Um, we are continually striving to meet the needs of the community. And these are all driven from within. We are progressive. As my colleagues have said, we are more than willing to sit down and speak with members of council and the community. COVID does put a hamper that, but we would like to m meet in the middle and try to further serve the community. Um, one of the things that we've also done is develop an RBT program that the state has modeled after. And I know I'm running out of time, but real quick, what RBT is, reality-based training, that is where we teach and test officers under stress. Research has shown that we need to teach in a contextual environment to apply that, those skills, whatever they may be, de-escalation, communication, emergency medical care. And I, I will just close with the city's mantra or one of them is people are our greatest assets. The way that this has been unfolded and having us reapply for our jobs does not feel like we are the city's greatest asset. And thanks, I would thanks, request Sergeant. council we're to- Well past, we're about a minute past the three minute mark as you see the, the alarm right there. But thanks Sergeant, please do submit your, your comments in writing too. So that they can be in the record and council could read uh, the remainder. Uh, thank you, Ted. Up next is Justin. After uh, Justin is Israel Cosgrove. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Hello, my name is Justin Baldessari, and I have lived in the Ithaca area for approximately 20 years. I went to Boynton Middle School, Ithaca High School, and Ithaca College. I'm currently employed with the City of Ithaca Police Department, where I've worked for the last six and a half years. Uh, I am speaking of, at this meeting in order to voice my concerns about the proposal you're being asked to review. Uh, I do not claim to have all the answers, but I am concerned about this proposal. The main issue that I find with this proposal is that you talk about eliminating our positions as we know them and rebranding them as positions that we will have to reapply for. Uh, the notion to reapply for a job that we already earned via civil service, physical fitness, ongoing commitment to the community, and rigorous training is quite frankly insulting. On top of that, you ask us to follow you into this plan when we have no idea what these positions offer as far as pay, benefits, and standing in our current retirement system. The most apt metaphor I've heard is agreeing to buy a house without knowing how much it's going to cost. The consequence of making a job undesirable to current officers is also a counterintuitive notion. You want these perfect beings as police officers, but if you make the job so undesirable that no self-respecting professional will take it, then you will find yourself having to hire people who would otherwise have never been hired in the first place. There will always be a need for some form of law enforcement, and the old adage does hold true. You do get what you pay for. The other major concern that I have is the idea of a civilian executive holding the position of chief of police. Why would it be appropriate for someone who has never worked in law enforcement to dictate the actions of professionals who put their lives on the line and who actually do this work on a daily basis? How can someone who has never experienced the stresses and lifestyle this job demands possibly have their employee's best interest in heart? Though I'm sure their heart would be in the right place, unfortunately, there is no way for them to be in, a, to be in that position effectively. Uh, 
it would be like appointing me as the chief of medicine at a hospital, despite me having no knowledge of the medical field whatsoever. I want to reiterate that we at the Ithaca Police Department are not afraid of change. As a matter of fact, we welcome it. Nothing in this world works perfectly, and if there are ways to make it better, then we would love to be a part of that. However, we are the leading experts in this field that is being discussed, and we have barely been consulted on the topic. To quote Schultz, it takes courage to sail in, unch in uncharted waters. We are brave enough to sail these waters with the citizens of this city, but not at the cost and expense of our families, the safety of the city, and our own well-being. Uh, I would like to round out my conversation pieces with a couple of questions. One being, what are the pay and benefits of these new positions that would be offered to police officers um, after we have to essentially be fired from our current position and reapply? And second, what is the advantage of having a civilian executive filling the role of chief of police? Uh, that's all I have. Uh, we're getting pretty close to the three minute mark. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Justin. Uh, next up is Israel and following Israel is William E. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. My name is Israel Cosgrove. Some of you know me, I'm 34 years old. I'm a husband and a father. I'm a police officer with our city of Ithaca. I have over 10 years law enforcement experience. I worked for three other departments prior to coming here. I have a degree in criminal justice. Uh, our union has been very clear that we don't support the most radical points of the police reform proposal. I'd like to share why I believe some of those points are a bad idea though. Uh, I don't think anyone should be surprised that we're not for losing our jobs uh, as proposed by the document. Uh, we recognize that there will be positions available to us uh, should we desire to remain employed by the city, uh, new armed and unarmed positions, however. Uh, I don't know any officer who would do this job without a firearm, and I'll, I'll tell you why. We respond to missed dispatch calls on a daily basis. Uh, these are 911 calls made to dispatch that come over the phone or radio as one thing, but when we arrive on scene, realize they're another. Uh, this is most often no fault of dispatch, but can be attributed to uh, telephone game issues, uh, inaccurate third-party reports, etc. Uh, for example, a noise complaint that we're sent to might actually turn out to be a domestic involving people yelling at each other. This past month in Warren County, Ohio, deputies responded to check the welfare of a man who, during initial contact, just opened fire on, on the police without warning. Human behavior can be really hard to predict and can escalate in a moment, and I speak to that from experience. Uh, this is why I'm not a proponent of sending an unarmed civilian to do this job either. Uh, I'm not going to advocate for placing a social worker in a dangerous position like that with no means to defend themselves or someone else. I'd like everyone also to consider that we've put away a lot of violent people, people who I'm sure harbor resentment towards us and who might take advantage of harming us where they just see us on the street without a firearm. Uh, it's also not uncommon for us to receive officer safety bulletins concerning individuals from, you know, other areas that are just out intent on harming police. Uh, Mayor Myrick, Common Council, um, you've described the work that we do as exemplary. Uh, thank you for that. I, I think it's known that we receive only a small number of civilian complaints each, each year. I don't see it as wise to dismantle an organization that is performing at such a level. Uh, we're not opposed to receiving training and or resources to assist us in doing our jobs even better, uh, but to promote a reduction in our tools and a reinvention of how we do things is extremely risky. Um, uh, and, and people's lives are at stake in the situations we are faced with. Um, in closing, and, and just on a, a personal level, uh, I'll say that I, I love my job, um, but I'm not willing to risk my children growing up without their father by working for a department that I don't have confidence in. Um, please edit this uh, reform proposal. That's all. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Israel. Uh, up next is William E. And following William is Ricky Russo. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is William of the Miatos. I am a resident and employee of the city of Ithaca. I usually do not comment on policy changes. Recently though, an interview published by GQ Magazine, I learned about a proposal to reimagine public safety in our city. Mayor Merrick, 
You decided to unveil this proposal to a magazine before your constituents and our police department. I, I don't understand this. No one knocked on my door and asked my opinion on it. I am a resident here. I'm not sure where you got all these ideas from. You've been defunding our police department since you became mayor. As our city grows, so should our police department and all departments and become more efficient. We've been trying to do that. This proposal appears to be a union busting move. Are you going to reimagine how other departments function next? Are we going to have to reapply for our jobs like you propose for our police? I cannot voice my opinion loud enough that we need more police, not less. As our city grows and it is growing, as we all can see with all the development all around us, we need more police, not less. How do you explain this to our college student parents who bring their kids here to get educated in supposedly a safe and beautiful city when you are proposing to eliminate the police department. As we grow, so does the criminal element. I've made Ithaca my home since 1989. And not till just last few years did I hear of shootings, stabbings, muggings, and graffiti all over the place on a regular basis. As you have been defunding our police department, the criminal element has risen. This proposal is outrageous. I love this city and I am proud and honored to be a resident and a part of its workforce, just like our police officers. I can imagine how they feel right now. We pay dearly to be able to live in Ithaca. I would like you all to come up with a plan to refund our police department and make Ithaca a safe place like it used to be, not eliminated. Please uh, forgive my tone if it was a little harsh, um, a little passionate about this. Uh, I respect uh, all of you and for all you do. Thank you very much. Your neighbor, William F. the Miatos. Thank you, William. Uh, next up is Ricky Russo. But I don't see him in the waiting room. So I'm going to take the next speaker, which is Zachary Wynn. Um, Ricky, please message me in the chat if you're there and we'll pick you up after Zachary. Um, if Ricky is not here, um, Michael Dundon will be our last speaker. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. I'd like to applaud the mayor's plan. He has managed to please absolutely no one while exacerbating existing issues and tensions. <clears throat> and I would like to give a shout out to Ithaca Pantheris, who should be elated. The police are going to be doing exactly what they have been asking uh, this entire time, which is quitting their jobs by finding employment with other departments. Uh, whilst Ithaca police is uh, experiencing a manpower shortage during a crime wave. Uh, this reform plan was initiated by an executive order from the governor, a governor now uh, beset with numerous credible allegations of impropriety, an issue itself that is dwarfed by the cover up of the deaths of thousands of elderly people in nursing homes. Uh, I would like to ask Mayor Svante Merrick to call on the governor, uh, Cuomo, to step down and following that himself to offer his resignation and set a, a positive example. Dissatisfaction with your performance is the one thing that all parties, the police, Black Lives Matter, Pantheris, and everyday citizens uh, seem to agree on. And this police reform plan needs to be scrapped immediately along with our governor and mayor. The breakdown in law and order in Ithaca is reminiscent of the road warrior. Violence has become commonplace as being a police officer becomes less desirable. The only people seeking out the job will be criminals themselves. I think it would be more efficient to simply give the police uniforms to the activists, uh, like in a clockwork orange, gang members parading around as the police as society crumbles. Uh, apart from that, I hope you all have a wonderful evening and I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you, Zachary. Our next speaker is Michael Dundon. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Mayor and it's the Common Council members. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Michael Dunn and I'm the president of Rome Tioga Central Labor Council, as well as the president and field representative for Labor's Local 785, which is located in the city of Ithaca. 
I'm speaking tonight in support of the Ithaca Police Department. The governor signed executive order number 203 in June of 2020. The executive order was put in place for municipalities to perform a comprehensive review of police policies, procedures, strategies, and practices, then develop a plan to approve any areas that need improvement all while addressing the needs of the community. Think about that for a second. How do you get rid of the Ithaca Police Department as part of a plan to improve public safety or to improve the relationship with the community? Now, speaking of the Ithaca Police Department, here's a workforce of men and women that have worked without a raise for 10 years. They continue to show up to work every day to protect and serve their community, yet no room for growth or raises. No one in any industry would continue to work as hard as these men and women have under those circumstances. To finish, I would like it to show on the record that this is not about police reform, but union busting at its core. To break up any union in the name of reform not only shows you don't care about local workers, I have to question your concern for public safety. Hopefully when it count, comes down to it, you realize that these hardworking men and women deserve to be heard and should be treated with respect and dignity. As a member of the Brotherhood and Sisterhood of Essential Workers, I'm asking you to do what is right and turn down this parole. Hopefully everybody has a wonderful evening and God bless. Thank you, uh, Michael. And that will conclude our public comment period. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Julie. Thanks, Dan, for uh, managing that. And thank you to everybody uh, who spoke. We really appreciate it. We'll go now to privilege of the floor. I'll, I'll say a few things. I know I said that we weren't discussing the proposal tonight, but I do feel like it's important, especially when we heard such uh, personal and, and impressive uh, pleas to be heard from the members of our police department. You know, I, I will say that there are uh, a great many benefits of a new department that would not replace us. I think somebody said, so was it circus? I forget the, the, the term that was used by Mike at the very beginning. But these would be real law enforcement officers. Our public safety workers are imagined not to be, uh, was it mall cops? I think something like that. Uh, but real uh, uh, officers of the law, right? Uh, with all of the same uh, uh, rights and responsibilities and equipment. And I think that's what's important and what's such a missed opportunity. You know, we heard from so many members of the union tonight saying that they supported reforms. I'd like to hear more specifically about which of the reforms they support because uh, for too long, uh, this has been an adversarial relationship where each and every reform has been opposed. And I uh, appreciated hearing about all the personal ties and connections to the community because one of the recommendations is a residency requirement for new officers because we too believe that personal ties to the community part of what keeps the officers safe and the community safe and having something like I think it's about 90 percent of the officers who work for the Ithaca Police Department not living inside the city of Ithaca has been uh, an ongoing and growing concern that we would like to address uh, but I also want to assure you that this is not an attempt at union busting and uh, desire to work collaboratively exists on my part since the very beginning of this process and still exists to this day, even through the last two weeks of exacerbated tensions. You know, uh, Billy mentioned that the, the uh, a magazine found out about these reform, reforms before the department itself. Well, it's just simply not true. You know, not only have the leadership in this department uh, been a part of the process for the entire time and uh, were given previews of this report in days and days before the report came out. But the report was released to everybody in the community at exactly the same time, 4 p.m. on Monday. The media did receive it in advance with an embargo until 4 p.m. My first call at exactly 4 p.m. on the dot was to Tom Kinzella, the head of the PBA president. That's a call that was not answered and still to this point not returned. Tuesday, uh, uh, all of the frontline supervisors were invited to a meeting to review the report, receive a presentation, to discuss it and to discuss implementation of it, including how we could address their concerns and, and ease some of their worries and work with them to design the new department. Uh, every member uh, boycotted that meeting and did not show up. I even had a lunch meeting on the schedule with Tom Gonzalez, the, uh, the president of the PBA union. It's a standing appointment that we made a month ago uh, on Monday that, that uh, was, was never held. The point is, if you want to work collaboratively, I too want to work collaboratively. I think there is room for us to figure out, particularly this, this claim about union busting is just false. It is just false. Now, it is true that we have had trouble 
myself, my administration, we've struggled to come up with a contract, a successfully negotiated, I think now it's nine contracts, maybe 10 contracts with six other unions in the time that the PBA has been out of contract. Uh, it does. It is because we're far apart and it takes two to tango. We've made many reasonable offers, what I believe to be reasonable offers that would increase uh, the salaries uh, of the members of a police union. But I believe that they've been poorly served by their council, received bad advice about what's possible and received advice that said to not negotiate for years, including turning down the offer to go to arbitration, a, a very poor choice that came from a, a, a very poor set of lawyers who told them that was the right way to go to get what they wanted. Now, so let me be very, very clear. Folks are saying this is a union busting attempt. Let me be very, very clear. I do not believe that we even have the legal ability to bust the union and that in a new department, the contract, if the officers chose it to, if you chose it to, and the PBA would carry over into that new department, right? Now, I hope that we could come up with a new agreement, one that brings their, uh, not just the pay into the 21st century, but also the training, the recruitment, the retention efforts into the 21st century. And I believe that we can do that over the next few years as we design this department to better serve, because look, it's not working. I know that it's not working. The current relationship is not working for the members of the department. You're not satisfied with the way you feel at work and you would appreciate and need better community cooperation and engagement and the community itself too wants to hear. It is true. The community does not want to see uh, the uh, all policing abolished. It just doesn't. In fact, what we heard is they want to see more people who work in our public safety department, who understand the community, who have the time to speak with them, who will get out of their cars, do foot patrols, speak with them, learn about their troubles, all of the things that we heard so eloquently and persuasively from, from Israel, from Loretta, uh, from Ted, from so many of the officers today. That too is what the community wants. But we're not going to get there if, one, we don't talk to each other. We just communicate through press releases and press conferences, right? Two, if we don't show up to meetings with each other to talk this out and figure out how we can move forward together. And three, if we're not willing to change, if we say, uh, yeah, we're willing to adopt some reforms, but you know what, we actually are good as we are. So we don't want real change. We're willing to accept some changes, but those changes remain unspecified. Uh, and to the members of the public who are, or who are concerned, I would be concerned too, if what I understood was, geez, the police are going away and there's nobody to replace them. That is not the plan, the intention. The, the plan and the intention is clear. The needs of the community have shifted uh, considerably over the last 50, 60 years. The public safety demands on our police have also shifted for a whole host of reasons that we could, I mean, changes in our mental health landscape, changes in, in our healthcare landscape, uh, changes in our economy. And uh, for those reasons, it really is important that we sit down together and figure out a new public safety delivery system. I'm committed to that. I've heard from my members of, of council uh, over the last week that they have been both open to and engaged in conversations with members of the union as well as members of the community. And I think that if we work together, we can design uh, a new department that, tr that truly does work for everybody, including the officers that currently work for the Oakland Police Department. We're going to, uh, uh, any other response to the public or privilege of the floor? Uh, yes, George. Hear me? Yeah. Um, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to second what the mayor just said about we need to work collaboratively through this. Um, I still don't understand why we don't want to call the police police moving forward. Um, and I would like to thank everybody that spoke tonight. Um, <clears throat> there were some definite uh, proposals for change that I heard from 
a number of officers. Uh, and I'll just end by saying, I wish I was a good a speaker and as clear, clear my thoughts as a number of the speakers were tonight. Thank you. Any other privilege of the floor? And I hate, and I'm, and I'm sorry if I put counsel on the spot, I really didn't intend to. I know that many of you are marshaling your thoughts and gathering your questions and suggestions for the March 10th. And I'll just repeat the schedule, March 10th, March 24th and March 31st meetings. So if you don't speak tonight, I don't want people to think that I, I, you don't have an opinion on the topic. I know you do, so you don't have ideas on how to improve the recommendation or to change it. I know you have that too. Um, so I don't want any speakers to get the idea. Oh, so-and-so didn't say anything, they must, whatever. Uh, uh, yes, Donna and then Cynthia. Uh, I've been taking this very seriously and have lots of, have had lots of conversations with many people, making notes to myself, sharing them occasionally. Um, this is a, e even if there are merits to recommendation number one, it's an awfully serious change. We spent months dismantling the Shade Tree Advisory Commission. I cannot imagine that we would consider dismantling the Ithaca Police Department in four weeks. Um, e e even if some of us had instincts in that direction. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sort of, sort of astounded uh, by, the, by the complexity of the change recommended in, outlined in recommendation number one and the timeline. Yeah, I think that's fair. All right, so I, I don't know if you, yeah, I, I think that's fair. And I think that's why the, the proposal says that we should take years to continue studying and working collaboratively to figure out what it would look like. And I would just say that there's not, you know, there were not national uprisings and local uprisings of thousands of people um, concerned about the Shade Tree Advisory Commission. That, that this is a more urgent need uh, in, in a far, and I love the Shade Tree Advisory Commission, so it seems like I was throwing shade at them, but it's not. It, this is a, um, this was serious work and you're right that council having only five weeks to con consider whether or not to move forward is not enough time. I do wish there was enough time. Even the nine months to get to this point was not enough time. I do wish it was enough time, but I think we can give ourselves more time to consider, uh, to continue considering it. Oh, sorry, uh, Cynthia. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate all the comments so far. And, um, and I appreciate, uh, Mayor, your description that, that this, is, this is a process, right? That, that is going to take time, it deserves careful thought and deliberation, deserves uh, collaboration with the partners involved and the willingness to uh, involve the police department and members of the police department and, and have that conversation. I, I definitely heard from the speakers today um, and in my conversations with police officers that they are absolutely willing to come to the table and, and work to enact all of the changes that have been proposed um, in partnership with, with council and the county to make that happen. And so, um, so I appreciate that. And, and I think perhaps then what I'm hearing that is that our job over the next couple of weeks is to actually and accurately describe that path in whatever that final resolution is that we adopt in conjunction with the county. It needs to be more clear, more deliberate, more explanatory so that we have a framework um, that not only leads us forward, but gives us something that, that we can make an educated decision on. Because right now with what we have, it, it's not enough. It's, it's clearly alarming. It's clearly destabilizing. Um, I, I recognize the, the, the baggage that we as a community have with regards to our community policing relationship. I carry you know, some of that anxiety myself, um, absolutely. But I also recognize that, that you know, we are a strong community because we believe 
that we are a strong community, that we believe in, in the networks and, and the relationships that we have. And our biggest asset, as I've always said, in the city, our biggest asset are, are not the trucks, it's not the pipes underground, it's not the electrical wires. Our biggest assets are the ones that go home every day and willingly come back the next day. It's those assets that we invest our time and our resources that we nurture and support us. And it's what carries us through when we are in times of stress. And I'm, I'm so deeply grateful to all of our officers um, who dedicate their lives and their families' lives to serving our community. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very appreciative of this conversation and, and would like very much to understand how we can move forward and lay it out in partnership with our officers as well as community members. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, Jackson. Uh, in addition to seconding what Savante said, I'd like to just reiterate something that Drs. Bradwell and Gonzalez did over and over in, in explaining their charge, which was to oversample the most vulnerable. And so while it may seem on the surface bewildering that we would consider such dramatic change when the numbers report such uh, you know, high satisfaction and low numbers of complaints, you know, th those of us who don't have an issue with the police are less well equipped to understand the, the the deep causes of, of the anxiety and, and, and negative interactions that uh, other people have with the police. And, you know, there, there is a lot of trust in, in the process in, in terms of trusting the people who are in the rooms with these people who refuse to speak to, to anyone other than these community leaders who have, have a reputation and had, or have the reputation that they felt comfortable with speaking in a, in a private um, conversation. And so there is some level of trust that we have to have that the people who ran these conversations uh, knew what they were doing and are reporting the, the facts as, as they heard them. Uh, but I do, and, and I feel like even if this is not the exact right answer and, and it may need uh, alterations here and there, we should all remember that it does come out of a process that was designed to emphasize the voices of, of the people who are most vulnerable. Thank you. Uh, yes, Seth. Yeah, I'll just I'll just say I know we're all taking this very seriously, and we've had a lot of conversations over the past you know week or so, just talking to constituents and community members and officers who have called us. And I mean, I can say for myself, you know, I despite the sort of tension and division that we've seen in the media, I, I do sense that there's a consensus around one big idea, which is that the department would be composed of two types of response, right? And uh, an armed law enforcement response. And no one is suggesting that we would get rid of that, but that there would also be an unarmed response, um, you know, perhaps along the lines of like our community outreach worker program or, um, the caseworkers we've talked about with LEAD who would be responding to, to mental health problems in the community, and that those two groups of individuals would work together. I think everybody supports that concept, and it's a good concept, and it makes a lot of sense for all the reasons that the mayor has talked about, the changes that need to happen. I think where we're caught up is, and I think we heard it tonight from the officers, is a lot of officers feeling like the notion that you know, they would be fired and then have to reapply is a real slap in the face. I mean, we do have officers in the department who have been working very hard for years and, you know, they're public servants and they've been, they see their own work as important and valuable to the community. And I think, you know, you know, I want to, I want to be able to value that work. And I don't, it makes me very uncomfortable to feel that we have, um, you know, good city employees who have been doing good work in the community who feel um, like they're not being seen and they're not, they don't matter. And I think that's what we really have to get past. Um, and as I said, I think the underlying concept is one that we can all sort of support and work towards. It's just a case of finding a resolution to uh, the first recommendation in the plan. 
Um, but I'm hopeful that we can get there. I really, I really am. You know, I think that we'll continue to talk about this um, at our committee of the whole meetings and other public meetings. And I, I continue to be hopeful that we can get to a resolution uh, that, that the community can support. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, I will just say then uh, for one last time that the March 10th meeting, March 24th and March 31st, uh, council will uh, be considering the draft recommendations and um, hopefully voting on the 31st for, for uh, whatever amendments uh, council makes along the way. The best way to both stay engaged and to put your input into the process is to go to the city of Ithaca's website and click on reimagining public safety. There's a, a, there you'll see a list of meetings that you can attend as well as a form, a survey uh, that you can fill out online that has a place to give you feedback. Great. So uh, we'll go now to so, uh, George. Is this privilege of the floor time? Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to uh, say something about uh, two women. Uh, one has just joined us and one has just left us. Uh, a woman named Ingrid left uh, her home in El Salvador almost three years ago. Um, she left in order to save her life. She made it to the American border um, where she was picked up by Border Patrol or ICE, I don't know who. And she was taken to Batavia, New York. And she's been there for over two years, held basically a prisoner. Um, a small group of people at Cornell, a professor and a handful of her students uh, got contact with Ingrid through uh, Justice for Migrant Families program. Um, and they found out that Ingrid was gonna be released last week she was released. She was left at a gas station in Buffalo with nothing. Um, and uh, this professor uh, drove to Buffalo and got Ingrid and brought her home to Ithaca, where she is now, recovering, safe. She doesn't speak English. I'm sure she doesn't even know where she is, really. Um, and I just want to say thank you to those people and and welcome Ingrid to our community. Uh, and if there are people listening who know more ways to help Ingrid than I do, uh, please contact me through the city website. But uh, welcome Ingrid. Uh, the second woman I'd like to talk about is Jane Marcham. Jane passed away a day or two ago. Uh, we, a lot of us love Jane. Jane was a member of Common Council. She was a respected journalist for the Ithaca Journal for many, many years. She uh, and her husband, John, lived on East Buffalo Street in a beautiful, big house. Um, and she asked Savante a number of times not to spoil her view, as I recall. Uh, and she passed away a couple days ago. And um, she was a, a really important member of this community. And I would just like to say to her family, she will be missed. Oh, so thank you. I didn't know about that. I, that is such a loss for the community. You're right. Jane was, when I, I was a rabble rousing young activist uh, who decided to run for common council. And she and her husband, John, were the first people that interviewed me. They were part of the ward committee. And they didn't vote for me then. And I don't think they ever, <laughs> I think they voted against me at every opportunity they had, but they, and, and they had me over for tea at every opportunity that they had. And they were so willing to share with me the history of the city and the community. And that is so terribly sad. You know, John's loss we've been feeling for the last, has it been four years or so? It's been a while, yeah. Jane is, Jane is um, 
just a titan of, of the community. That's a, a tremendously sad loss. Um, George, thank you for sharing and for, for memorializing her. Well, I didn't even know that. Her, her daughter just called me this afternoon and told me. I have to reach out. That's, thank you, George. All right, any other uh, privilege of the floor? Okay, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, would anyone like to move the consent agenda? Moved by Deb. Is there a second? Second by Steve. All those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Uh, next is the city administration committee. Uh, Deb, any report? Yeah, no, we had um, all of our items were small and on consent for, there's been a lot of new chatter around uh, the issue on 5G. So I just wanted to publicly report, it looks like April will be the month in which we get a look at the design guidelines. Seth, who chairs our other standing committee and I are gonna look at what is on our agendas for April and figure out which committee it makes the most sense to run that through. So we'll be able to let you know in March what, what we think um, that will look like. And it's a budget meeting planning time again. So Dan and I are gonna work on getting some dates together and getting them to everyone. Not sure if we'll be in person yet by October, but it is time for us. And thank you, Donna, for reminding us earlier that we needed to get those dates out to everyone. Other than that, I guess we'll just turn it over to Steve. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, just a couple items here. Uh, we continue to work on closing 2020 activity. We're busy posting all the year end activity. I don't really have a, a real update on the 2020 bottom line at this point, uh, but I can give you a couple items related. Our final 2020 sales tax numbers are in. Uh, we ended up at uh, collections of $13,250,000 uh, for 2020. Uh, this number is $2,364,000 off our original budget for 2020. So for comparison's sakes, uh, we collected uh, $15,472,000 in 2019. So we were a little over 15% off our budget amount. Uh, and of course, just about all of that has to do with COVID impacts. Uh, for 2021 collections of sales tax, we've <clears throat> collected uh, $894,000 to date. Obviously, we're early in collections. Um, and if you look at those numbers, they are about 10% off of our 2020 uh, numbers, uh, comparing at the same time period for the first two months of activity. So in 2020, we were very strong uh, in the first two months and then went downhill with COVID. So uh, we'll see how things uh, shake out for the, the rest of 2021. Uh, we did budget for 2021 $13,843,000, which is 11.4% uh, uh, decrease from our 2020 budget. So uh, we did uh, factor in the uh, COVID impacts the best we could uh, with the information that we had. So it's early. Uh, we're hopeful now that the students are back. Uh, the, COVID cases are lower and the vaccine is, is out and about and hopefully and eventually that'll help our collections for 2021. Also, we're working uh, with FEMA on reimbursement of COVID expenses uh, that we've incurred to date. Uh, we are now eligible for 100% reimbursement of some of those costs. Uh, this process takes a long time. You have to work through um, FEMA for this. Uh, and also New York State. So uh, we're doing that process now. It'll take uh, a few months to complete that process. In addition, we are still awaiting uh, word or, or actually uh, funds from New York State on our AIM payments related to 2020. Uh, if you recall, uh, we uh, saw a reduction in our AIM payment for 2020 of 20%. We have been notified by New York State that Is, is that me or is that Steve? He's frozen for me too. Me too. I think it's Steve. It looks like both Steve and Julie are frozen. So I don't know if it's a city hall thing. 
I think it's a bad news thing. Too much bad news. And Zoom says <laughs> no more. Out. Uh, we are. They did say that we should get it by the end of March. So, so sorry, we'll, Steve. Steve, oh. I'm sorry. We lost about the last 20 seconds. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, I was talking about the uh, the New York State AIM payment. Um, so we uh, had about a 20 percent. Uh, reduction in 2020, we we're expected to receive another 15% reimbursement for 2020, and we're still waiting for that uh, from New York State. We've uh, been told that we'll receive that uh, by the end of March, and hopefully we will. Uh, and uh, lastly, we've just been busy with several I'm, upgrades. I'm sorry, our, Steve, oh. what does that mean? So we expected a 20% reduction, but we got 15% back. So is it a net 5% reduction or? Yeah, so, right, okay. exactly. So right. it's a, it would be a net 5% reduction as long as everything comes forth uh, the way the New York State has said, so. Got it, thank you. Yeah. In addition, the 2021 budget, uh, we are still expecting a 20% reduction in our aim payment. Uh, that's what the governor had proposed and that continues obviously with budget discussions through the end of this month and we'll see where that ends up. Uh, lastly, we uh, have been also busy with uh, several upgrades to our financial software. Um, and so we'll continue that work throughout 2021 and into 2022. And hopefully by the end, we'll have a much more efficient uh, operation of uh, our financial activity for the city. So I will end the report there. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Steve? None, let's just, I think everybody's got the same come on American Rescue Plan face on, which is like- well, That 15% back from the state, that's semi good news. Yeah, that is. Yeah, it definitely is, yeah. Yeah, and that it's not as bad as it, as we feared. Right, um, right. It's, just, it's not itself a good bumper sticker slogan. Uh, it's not as bad as we feared. Okay, thanks. And Deb, anything else? from CA? Okay, no. the Planning Committee and uh, Chair Murtaugh. Yeah, so I, first up, I think we have a report from uh, Brian McCracken. Brian, I don't know if you wanted to, if you're planning to present anything alongside the memo you had submitted. Yeah, uh, the, the plan was just to summarize the memo and then I'll open it up for questions, uh, a very brief summary. Uh, typically what I do is just submit the report to council and the mayor. And then uh, with uh, conversations with Director Cornish, it, it became clear that that doesn't give counsel the opportunity to comment and question what's in the report. So I thought tonight I would just give a brief overview um, if people would like to listen and then open it up for questions. All right, let me reduce that. Okay, um, so uh, again, a brief overview of what the Ithaca Landmarks Preservation Commission and the staff did last year. Um, one of the primary responsibilities of the Landmarks Commission is to conduct design reviews for uh, locally designated properties. So last year, the commission reviewed 18 cases um, or applications for certificates of appropriateness and approved uh, 16 of the 18 they reviewed uh, for approval rate of 89%, which is pretty good and on par with um, kind of the, the statewide average. Um, in addition to the 18 cases that were reviewed by the commission, there were also 34 projects that were reviewed by city staff um, for administrative reviews. Um, all of those projects were reviewed. So in total, the commission reviewed, um, let's see, they reviewed 52 projects and of the 52 reviewed, 50 were approved for a 96% 90, approval rate, which is pretty high. Um, in addition to the required design reviews, the commission um, or its staff also looked at several other projects. Uh, the first was the Herald Square project in the Sage Block building that was part of that. Um, as part of their site plan review process, there was a condition added to their approval that required them to go to the Landmarks Commission for the restoration of the Sage Block building. So the commission reviewed uh, the alterations to the windows, the repair of the masonry, the new storefront, and then staff remained involved throughout the, the construction phases of the project to make sure that everything was on track. 
Um, they also commented on the redevelopment of 430 West State Street, which is the Mama Goose building. Um, for, you, for those of you who don't know, a portion of the mid 19th century commercial building where Mama Goose is currently housed will be retained um, as part of the redevelopment project. And the ILPC was very supportive of that proposal. Um, then 600 Thurston Ave or Balch Hall. Uh, this was another um, recommended review by the planning board. Um, the project is undergoing major restoration in the upcoming, in the next year or two. And as part of that, all of the windows will be replaced and um, the planning board felt it would be appropriate for the ILPC and staff to review the proposed new windows to make sure that the historic character of this building, which is not locally designated um, and is not listed on the National Register, but is largely recognized as being a historic resource, that character of the building is maintained. Uh, finally, the Cascadilla Boathouse, which is listed on the National Register of Historic Places and um, does have a preservation covenant on it. So any work that is proposed for the building has to be re reviewed by the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, in 2020, the city was awarded um, an Environmental Protection Fund grant to rehab the exterior of the building. And so staff worked with um, Historic Ithaca uh, to select an architect for the, for the uh, project, uh, Barrow Architecture out of Rochester. And then later in the year, um, I reviewed uh, design drawings for that uh, project, which went out to bid today. Uh, hopefully a contractor will be selected soon. And the hope is that the project will be completed by the end of the year. Uh, the real property tax exemption for historic properties. Um, so for those of you who don't know, this is a program that was established in 1997. Uh, Ithaca was actually the, the originator of this program and shepherded through the enabling legislation that now allows all other communities in the, in the state that wish to participate in it to uh, use this program. It provides uh, a local property tax exemption for major improvements to historic properties. So last year there were there were ten properties enrolled in the program, and I'm not going to go through the numbers. Um, they're all included in the report, um, and so the ten properties are there. Uh, the the savings for the property owners uh, is included, as well as the running total of uh, the amount these property owners have saved uh, over the course of their their life in the uh, program, and you know the total investment of of public funds. Uh, through the property tax exemption in historic preservation. Uh, I should note too that there were three, pro three properties that retired from the program last year. So they reached their full taxable value and are now um, you know, fully, fully um, paying their full tax bill. Um, another part of what I see my job as, as being important in my job is doing public outreach and engagement. So there were two um, things that I did last year to engage the public. The first was uh, Unseen Ithaca, a tour of uh, Two Fountain Place, which is the former Ithaca president's home on East Hill, uh, right next door to Jane Marchum's house. Um, and then uh, the second was um, in December, I co-presented at the statewide historic preservation conference on uh, the challenges and, and benefits of, of working in historic preservation in Ithaca. Um, it was a great program um, with that, that I worked with uh, Saratoga Springs Preservation, uh, their, their director there. Um, it's, it's very interesting, the, the similarities between our two communities. Um, we, uh, as a commission and in this role, we're also responsible for identifying uh, properties with potential historic value or, or properties that should their value historic history should be included in our planning efforts. Um, so I worked with a class at Cornell last year uh, to survey 24 properties on South Hill. This is the first phase of likely a multi-year project that will look at potentially historic resources on South Hill. Um, and it's something that we as a department thought was a good idea um, because it will help inform other planning efforts on South Hill and, and potentially an upcoming uh, neighborhood plan. Uh, and then finally, uh, which we've talked about at the last couple of council meetings, the, the partnership with the town um, to consider a, a joint historic preservation program. So with that, I'm gonna open, up, open it up to questions. 
Thank you, Brian. Any questions for Brian? I see Graham and then Donna, then George. Brian, uh, thanks for that report. I had a question on that um, tax exemption uh, program. So is there a limit to the number of properties that can be in, enrolled in that? or it's And it's a 10-year life cycle. Is that what you said? Yes, okay. it's a 10-year life cycle, and there's no limit to the number of properties that have to be or that can be enrolled in the program. Um, the qualification to be enrolled is um, a substantial investment in your property, either uh, rehabilitating the exterior and the interior, doing major structural work, um, any activity that would raise the assessed value of the property. Got it. Thank you. And uh, actually, while we're on the topic, I wanted to thank Donna for her excellent liaison notes from these meetings. They're great. Thank you. And thank you, Brian. Thank you, Graham. Thanks. So I have uh, George and then Donna. Oh, Donna's first. Donna's first. Thank you. Donna and then Donna. I just want to say that I've really enjoyed serving this li liaison to the ILPC and getting to know Brian and the other members. And I've learned a whole lot about windows these last few years. Um, so it's, uh, it's actually been a great experience to, um, to be with them. I appreciate that. Thank you, Donna. And we've really enjoyed having you as well. So thank you. Uh, sure. Yeah, thank you, Donna, and, and thank you, Brian, for your good work. Um, I have a question about the Cascadella Boathouse. When we make that big room upstairs into the Common Council Lounge, should we get a pool table that kind of looks like uh, uh, Mark Twain's old pool table, like something that fits with the historic character? I think that's a really great idea, George, and I'll make sure that it's included in our conversations about rehabbing the interior of the building. Thank you very much. <laughs> the I think the number one wedding destination in the future. I mean, that that uh, yeah. uh, Rob. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Brian, for this. Just a quick question about the tax exempt uh, properties that have been participating. I, I recognize some of these are probably within historic districts. Are they all within her historic district or are there some buildings that are sort of standalone? Properties? Let me let me scan it quickly. I believe they're all within historic districts. Yes, there are no individual landmarks on the list, but um, as an individual local landmark, you are, are eligible for the program as well. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Great. Oh, one one note about the list too. I, I noticed a typo this this evening when I was reviewing the document. Um, it should be three ten West State Street, not three ten East State Street. Okay. Any other questions? Oh yes, Cynthia. Sorry, down in the bottom left. Thank you. Um, thanks, Brian, for for all of this. Could you tell me a little bit about what came out of the result of your uh, South Hill investigation? Is I'm going to presume that maybe a group of properties were identified. What what are the next steps with the result of that work? So it was it was largely fact finding work to see what resources might be there. Um, the the students looked at properties that have historic merit and, and properties that, that likely don't, would not rise to the level of, of designation. Um, they were scattered throughout the neighborhood. They're largely on Hudson um, and Pleasant Street, I believe. Um, but there's, there's a lot of additional work that will need to be done to, to kind of have a, collect, a large collection of buildings so we can really understand what, you know, the historic resources are and, and what, if any, any designations or proposed nominations come out of that. Okay, so um, it would be time then, I'm going to presume, before any kind of recommendation comes, and that would be in advance of a South Hill neighborhood plan or in conjunction with? Uh, it would be in conjunction with. Um, as we've worked through the, the neighborhood planning documents, we've been trying to include um, historic resource surveys and recommendations for designations within those documents. That way, the, um, 
the designation of historic resources is a part of the overall planning process for a neighborhood. Uh, that way, you know, everything is really evaluated at the same time. I got it. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we'll move on Thanks, now Brian. to the uh, IORA mini, uh, action plan. Yes, uh, 5.2 is approval of the IORA 2021 mini action plan. Uh, whereas the city is contracted with the Ithaca Urban Renewal Agency to administer, implement, and monitor the city's HUD entitlement program. Uh, whereas at its January meeting, the IURA authorized Ithaca Neighborhood Housing Services to incur home investment partnerships program pre-award costs in an amount not to exceed $30,000 to undertake uh, the 110 Auburn Street affordable homeownership project subject to common council approval. Whereas the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development requires that at least 15% of home funds be set aside for specific activities to be undertaken by a special type of nonprofit called a community housing development organization. Whereas NHS is the city of Ithaca's only community development or community housing development organization. Whereas INHS has entered into a purchase agreement to acquire a vacant home in Ithaca's Fall Creek neighborhood, a high opportunity neighborhood where few affordable home ownership opportunities exist. Whereas INHS proposes to purchase and rehabilitate the single family home at 110 Auburn Street to enroll in the INHS Community Housing Trust Program as an affordable homeownership project. Whereas INHS has submitted a funding application to the IRA for $30,000 from the HUD Entitlement Program. Whereas the home can be ready for sale in the fall if rehabilitation activities commence in March. Whereas HUD regulations normally prohibit a grantee from incurring project costs, even at its own risk prior to city adoption of the action plan. And whereas home regulations authorize pre-award costs in accordance with regulations uh, at 24 CFR, and whereas pre-award costs may be incurred subject to the following requirements, there's a list of requirements here. Uh, the amount of pre-award may not exceed 25% of the current home allocation. Uh, two, preparation of a proposed mini action plan for the pre-award project. Three, 30-day public comment period. Four, a public hearing with a 10-day prior notice. Five, common council approval of a mini action plan. And six, completion of the environmental review. And whereas public hearings were the legally required public hearings were already held uh, in accordance with the, the law. And whereas expanding the supply of affordable homeownership opportunities is identified as a priority need in the five-year consolidated plan. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the common council for the city of Ithaca hereby approves the proposed mini action plan to authorize INHS to incur home pre-award costs in an amount not to exceed $30,000 to undertake the 110 Auburn Street Affordable Homeownership Project, be a further resolved that the 2021 HUD Action Plan shall include the approved pre-award activity as a CHDO set aside project funded from the home allocation. And I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Second by Graham. Uh, discussion. Oh, yes, Laura. Uh, thank you. I will just uh, say that I'm very happy to support this resolution. It meets a number of goals. It will allow uh, home ownership in the city of Ithaca for a low moderate income family and will ensure by being part of INHS's Community Housing Trust Program that that home will remain in the affordable market in perpetuity. So this seems to uh, meet a number of goals and I'm very happy to support this. Thank you, Seth. Yeah, I'll, I'll second this. And you know, we had a lengthy discussion about this at, at the planning committee. Um, and I said, I said this there, but I'll say it again. Just you know, there's been this trend. I've definitely seen it in my neighborhood where um, you know cheaper homes that maybe need some work tend to be scooped up by developers who then will flip them and rent them out by the bedroom. And I think it's great that INHS is proposing to buy this and and um, you know, sell it to a homeowner who will live in Fall Creek, a place where, you know, as we've seen, there's the housing market is, is really competitive. It's really difficult for um, lower income people to find a foothold. And I think there's a lot of advantages to living downtown, as we all know, you know, uh, school districts and being close to work. And, and I think this is a great, great opportunity for, um, for the city. 
Yeah, I agree. Great. Okay, are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Those opposed? And that carries nine to one. Uh, thank you. Uh, Seth, any uh, other report from planning? Um, I guess the only thing is, you know, we'll continue to do our review of the green green building code. Um, that's going to be up on the next agenda. So anyone who's interested in that topic um, should attend. In fact, I think we're actually inviting, we're going to invite the full council to the meeting. Um, you know, it's, a, it's obviously, it's a, it's a really big, complicated change for the city. Uh, we had a lengthy discussion in the last month's meeting and, and we'll continue it and hopefully uh, vote it on the council at the next meeting. Thanks, Seth. Uh, great. So next is appointments. This is a slate of reappointments to the community police board. Would anyone like to move those? Moved by Graham. Is there a second? Moved our liaison. Thank you, Graham, for acting as liaison. Is there a second? Second by Seth. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? And that carries unanimously. Uh, next reports. Any reports of council liaisons? Report of, oh yes, Laura, right under the wire. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's not so much a liaison report as a report as a member of the TCAT board. Um, and Duxon can chime in on this as well, but the TCAT uh, board has decided that there will not be a reapplication of a build grant from TCAT. And what that means is that TCAT, the facility will remain on Willow Avenue uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, this year in 2021, there will be negotiations of renegotiations, renegotiation, I should say, with uh, the Cornell MOU and the terms of agreement amongst all three of the underwriters. So it will be a busy year for uh, TCAP with these renegotiated agreements. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so report to City Clerk. I have no report, thank you. Okay, uh, report to City Attorney. Um, none other than the uh, upcoming executive session on the agenda. Great, thank you. Uh, so is there a motion to enter executive session to discuss labor contract negotiations? Moved by Steve, seconded by Donna. All those in favor? And that carries unanimously. There is not a vote expected. Right, uh, Ari? Yes, there's uh, no, uh, right. no book. Yep. You know, we've done this like three months in a row now and I keep forgetting, maybe Julie could help or Ari. So do we stop the broadcasts now and then just? Yes, yeah. um, I yeah. am going to make, Dan, are you staying for the executive session? Yeah, I can okay. stay and- um... I will make you host. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Dan, there's still an attend, Julie. Yep, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and lock the Great. webinar.